Well, it's my pleasure um, to, as a biologist uh, and director of environmental studies. Oh, uh, first I wanted to thank again our co-sponsors. Co um, we have uh, Tisch College who has provided us this room and we're deeply thankful for this, this collaboration and the uh, Trust in Student Environment that has um, supported us in sort of providing you with lunch. And, and um, Coco Gomez, um, the assistant director, couldn't be here today um, due to school closings. She is uh, with us remotely. Um, but I want to thank her again for putting together such an amazing list of speakers each semester. Um, so anyway, Daniel Zizamia comes to us from, he's a ZIF environmental fellow at Harvard University. He actually grew up in Connecticut um, and went to UConn for his bachelor's and master's and then had West as a, uh, as a theme, the Western expansion. So he's experienced that Western expansion personally, uh, went West initially to um, University of Montana, but then decided that he really wanted to pursue a PhD, uh, PhD in anthropology and history, sorry, sorry, uh, in history at Bo um, Bozeman at uh, Montana State. And um, I couldn't be more excited to learn more about this topic. Someone who grew up on the West Coast in Seattle, I've often remember re watching shows and thinking about sort of the West and that expansion. And here, I think he's going to put a twist on it that is going to blow my mind. So thank you for coming, and we look forward to your talk. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you all for coming in this wild storm. I also thought nothing was going to happen uh, and was extremely surprised to see uh, the many inches here and decided this morning that I was going to walk from Cambridge to here, uh, which was a mixed blessing. It was it nice. Worked. It worked. It worked. But um, more tiring than I anticipated. Um, I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad you're all here. Uh, and I am going to be taking sort of a, uh, a different look at um, Euro-American expansion into the American West. Uh, and I'm also going to get started in, in an unconventional uh, way here. Uh, and that's with looking at a comparison uh, between planets. Uh, so what do Mars and the American West share in common. So I want to look at one commonality here. Uh, they're wet geohistories that impact how we understand their potential. So for the Curiosity rover has uh, created some beautiful images, uh, given us some beautiful images of the, the landscape of Mars. Uh, but as you can see, it is the desert planet of our solar system. Uh, it's traditionally seen that way. Uh, however, uh, with the Curiosity rover uh, landing in the Gale Crater, uh, there's been a revelation, um, some concrete proof, more or less, uh, of a geologic history that was wet. Um, one where there were ancient lakes on Mars, somewhere around 3.5 billion years ago. Uh, this has actually helped to reignite some hopes uh, among those fascinated by terraforming uh, that the future of Mars could also be wet. Uh, this is the reconstruction uh, that was done by NASA uh, of what this ancient Mars could look like. Uh, in the popular press, this came out in 2010 in the National Geographic, showing on a thousand year time scale the possibility of terraforming Mars, the possibility of it making it more Earth like. Uh, the big idea, making Mars a new Earth. Commonality here, draw your attention to, is the West was also thought of as a barren landscape, uh, one that was essentially just a barrier to civilization, uh, would block Western expansion, and unsuitable for a civilization built on agriculture. Uh, two figures feature prominently in this history, uh, Zebulon Pike, uh, in the early 1800s, following on the tales of, and coincident in some ways, with Lewis and Clark, Clark's expedition. Um, but also, uh, Stephen Harriman Long, uh, who actually defined and came up with the term the Great American Desert and put it on a map. Uh, this happened around 1820. Uh, and these maps, his, he was a very able cartographer. And this was actually a pretty scientific expedition uh, for, the, for the day. Uh, 
And because he was such an able cartographer, these masks were reproduced uh, and penetrated into the popular consciousness of this uh, environment, of, this, of the West, and how people perce perceived it. We'll return to this uh, in a little while. Uh, what lies beneath the West? Also, an ancient landscape that was watery once. Western, Western Cretaceous Interior Seaway. I can see here in a beautiful paleo map reconstruction by Ron Blakey. About 85 million years ago, a large seaway going through the interior of the West. Uh, what we would traditionally could define as the Great Plain uh, region. Over time, this lake shrunk, um, or this seaway shrunk. Uh, and as uh, time went on, 65 million years ago, close of the Cretaceous, beginning of the tertiary, the Paleogene period, the West became dotted with lakes uh, rather than uh, the seaway. And this is the period of uh, mountain building in the West. Uh, so the Rocky Mountains started to get developed uh, and uh, a heavy amount of tectonic activity altering this landscape. Um, and the, the atmosphere is completely different than it is, it is today. Uh, the climate itself is very different than it is today. Uh, it was able to support a far greater uh, variety of life and a large amount of vegetation. And this vegetation fed into uh, the creation of large coal deposits in the American West, uh, as well as the seaway uh, being the source of many fossils, uh, marine fossils in the American West um, uh, that were buried under the sediment. James Dwight Dana, uh, one of the first people to make these, these paleo maps, um, also had this very popular manual of geology uh, that, that was uh, first developed in 1863. Uh, and this is his depiction of it. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's similar in nature. Uh, from this transition from the Cretaceous to the Tertiary, uh, it gets a bit more sophisticated with more knowledge. It gets generated during the period that I'm going to be discussing today with the survey scientists going out into the American West and are covering more evidence of this, uh, of these ancient landscapes. But he called it the Cretaceous Mediterranean Sea um, during that day. By the close of the century, absent key geological concepts such as plate tectonics, many of the basic characteristics of the climate and geography of the ancient West were being conceived. In fact, the ge geologic history detailed above was built upon the foundation of the fieldwork. Uh, of 19th century scientists, explorers, who touched a deep past and interpreted its significance. Uh, so to give you an idea where we're going here, uh, general thesis for you. Historians have long understood the West as a region shaped by aridity. Yet by analyzing scientific imaginations as they interacted with the materiality of Western landscape, I argue that the history of the American West was equally influenced by the discovery of the watery deep past of the Paleo landscape. The physical geography and remnant resources generated through geologic time in the American West decisively influenced Western settlement and the advancement of American science in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Through government reports, scientists breathed new life into the ancient denizens of environments of the West. Where others saw an eternal and timeless desert, many scientists saw a plastic and ever-evolving environment. Boosters absorbed the authority of their science to lend credence to visions of a plastic West that had once again become a verdant paradise. Imagine vibrant paleo environments were trade once in the future fertile landscapes that overrode the dominant perception of the American West as, an, as arid and hospital life, a great American desert. With the power granted by coal paired with new technologies and the Eden-like scientific visions of a former fertile West, vast human-induced climatological changes became an empowering possibility to a nation driven to settle the West. Indeed, elements of today's plans for planetary engineering, the terraforming I discussed earlier, have their origins, I argue, in the 19th century drive to recreate the American frontier. Uh, you may be asking yourself how I'm defining the West. Uh, I don't define the West as, there's many defi definitions out there. Uh, some that include California, some that don't. I'm looking at the Great Plains region that's interior, that's inner mountain west, um, between the Mississippi River uh, and essentially the Rocky Mountains. Um, APA defines this region as the Great Plains. Um, we have the eco region in this pink uh, outline, and the dark gray outline of the states 
is the political boundary that they define as the uh, Great Plains region. Uh, I want to draw your attention to a couple other features of this map. Uh, you may not be able to see this, uh, probably from, uh, especially from the back of this, uh, this room, but we have coal fields by age here. Uh, so the coal fields mainly being Cretaceous, Cretaceous tertiary uh, coals in the American West. Uh, and you can see that in the yellow and, and, and green color, uh, the coal deposits there. I also have the first transcontinental railroad running through the center there. Uh, let's see, right here. Uh, the Union Pacific Railroad completed in 1869. Uh, and you can see it running through major coal resources in Wyoming here. Go back there just for a second. Uh, this is essentially this desert core uh, or heart of America on the uplisted floor of the Spanish seascape that I discussed earlier. Uh, it was, it is referred to as the Great Plains today, but this didn't really get traction until the 1930s became a kind of traditional way of defining this region. And the nucleus of this geography is the 400 square miles of the Great American Desert, this center area, this square here, uh, rectangle here, uh, defined by Major Stephen Harriman Long. He actually put longitude and latitude uh, in his report to say this is where this is where this Great American Desert is. Uh, and then he kind of fudged with it, saying, well, it does kind of extend a bit up here and a little bit over here. And, uh, but also, in reality, his exploration was a sort of U-shape in here, because uh, his trip into the West was heavily constrained by Congress, uh, and he, he had to make his way back. But after this 1819-1820 expedition, as I mentioned, this desert really made it into the minds of, of Americans, um, and it really made it this region in dire need of redemption uh, following the Civil War. So to give you a sense of where we're going to go from here, uh, I'm going to take a quick look at ro ra coal, railroads, and science, the sort of fusion of these things. Look at fossils and geohistory. Look at the geological foundations for rainfall as the plow. Uh, the process from there of Reclamation in the West, trying to reclaim the garden of the West by force uh, uh, through, say, the use of fossil fuels, and conclusion. So Long's legacy faded in the decades following the Civil War, when scientific surveys, sponsored by an increasingly empowered federal government, were paired with utilitarian needs and avarice of transcontinental railroad barons. The awe-inspiring trans. Uh, environmental technical system of the transcontinental railroads implicitly advanced the possibility of a truly malleable West by using the exceptionally energetic potential of coal to become the model technology for human dominion over nature. Now these are a couple other transcontinentals that get developed during the time. Uh, this is the uh, Great Northern uh, along the High Line. Um, there's also along the uh, lower, lower part of, of Montana, um, the Northern Pacific that gets developed, and we have uh, the western part, portion of the Union Pacific uh, depicted in the 1909 map. And these come from uh, the passenger booklets uh, during this period. The railroads also bound together and uncovered the geography of the of ancient environment uh, because they were really interested in this coal. Um, they provided transportation to scientists to begin to dig below the arid landscape and expand the material archive of America's deep western past by locating these large coal reserves and resurrecting remains of paleo environments. So, for example, in 1864, uh, geologist James C. Hodge, working for the Union Pacific Railroad, reported on the coal root resources of the Rocky Mountains. He specifically remarked that though deficient forests, lack of wood will be compensated by the abundant supply of the mineral coal. Railroads such as Union Pacific and the Great Northern utilize coal in the timber deficient west to fuel locomotives, uh, create industrial sites, and promote settlement. The east was east was first. East was first, yes. Um, so the uh, uh, coal regions of say Pennsylvania uh, were heavily exploited. Um, prior to this, yeah, they, they um, fed industrial furnaces well before uh, uh, they were doing so in the American West. Um, but they were necessary 
for these railroads to make it across the West because the timber that did exist in this, in this area had to be used for tracks, uh, other infrastructure. Uh, uh, so they needed some sort of alternative fuel, fuel source. Uh, to give you an idea of this, uh, from 1884, uh, Charles Sargent's map on the forests of North America over the 10th census, uh, you see a, a heavily deficient area in this, in this Great Plains region. Um, and to give you an idea of the coal resources, they're, they're heavily uncovered uh, by, the, by this period and just beginning to be uncovered in the, in the West, um, even by the 1880s, uh, the coal resources. Examining the stratigraphy around the lignite coal seam, Hodge found fossil shells and deciduous leaves that signified the Cretaceous age, that period when much of the West's coal was formed. It was often called Cretaceous, although it was on the sort of order, tertiary period, uh, Paleogene. Uh, it was often labeled as Cretaceous because the refinement wasn't fully there um, between these periods. This established technique that became known as biostratigraphy in the early 20th century made fossils a crucial guide to finding fossil fuels. Uh, this is from Dana's 1863 uh, manual, which Hodge would have had access to, uh, showing shells he could, be, could have been fi finding, as well as uh, leaf impressions he could have been finding. Leo Lescaro is a major figure in this, uh, in this drama as well. Um, he is a major theorizer of the or vegetable origins of coal uh, and a major figure in determining the, the paleontology uh, of coal. The, it's, um, and it's essential nature and character and, and also helping to trace the deposits not only in the east but also in the west. But he didn't just think about these fossilized remains, uh, this coal, in this very basic sense. That's uh, very, um, um, I say, it's what we could possibly say as a sanitized scientific sense. He thought about them, and he's mentioning this in the USGS survey, uh, the territories of, uh, of Wyoming in 1871. Uh, thinking right about that connection, the nexus between how these fossil plants relate to present civilization. So he says that fossil, so say that fossil plants have a relation to our present civilization appears at first sight a paradoxical affirmation. Well, what is coal? A mere agglomeration of petrified debris of plants. And who at a time could refuse to admit the influence of coal upon our actual civilization? Coal is the great generator of heat, of steam, of force, a potent auxiliary to every kind of engineering. It helps to, helps to the construction of our railroads. It brings to them to countries which without it would remain deserts and transports everywhere with lightning speed, not only the necessaries of life, but the products of industry essentially due to its active cooperation. Coal is now used everywhere and is the friend of everybody. It has become an object not of mere commodity, but of absolute necessity. Uh, so that gives you a sense of you know, how people were thinking during this time. Uh, and this is, a, this is a paleontologist, a paleobotanist. Um, uh, and this is a part of his report about fossilized plants uh, in, this, in the United States Geological Survey of the Territories. In fact, coal was seen by many citizens of the 19th century as quite literally a gift from God. Uh, Edward Hitchcock would venture, mention it as one of the signs of divine beneficence. Um, yes. Given, granted to humanity to use. Um, energy stored for those, in fact, intelligent enough and civilized enough to put it to use. It was also a marker of civilization. Uh, so those who did not use it were less civilized, more savage. It was a providential sign of manifest destiny that it was embedded in the North American continent to be used. So the abundance of coal in America spoke to the nation's greatness and future prosperity. Uh, this is the uh, celebration in the May 10, 1869, Promontory Summit, Utah, for the Transcontinental's first, um, the completion of the, the first Transcontinental Railroad. And this is a very famous painting by John Gast uh, in 1872, called American Progress. Uh, here you have Columbia um, making her way west, uh, holding a school book, uh, so knowledge, um, 
going from the light to the dark, they're carrying a telegraph line, uh, and the railroads are going and making their way west as well uh, to go forward and march forth and um, create a new uh, nation uh, throughout the, the western part of the continent. So this technological system of coal-fueled railroads ensured that ma Americans saw this region as plastic and time as condensed. It reinforced an image of impermanence and rapid change and helped to reveal science, the science, the actual science of the deep past. By exploiting the power of coal and helping science explorers open the pages of North America's deep history, the railroads changed how Americans experienced space and time by condensing not only geographic space, but geologic time. I'm going to take a quick look uh, in more depth of fossils. Uh, this uh, is a more modern uh, representation of this. This is a postcard for Wyoming. Um, a kind of boosting for the area. Come to Wyoming and experience this, this, this deep past. Um, uh, have fun here looking at, at, at these, these ancient remnants. Uh, and, you know, I draw your attention to this for another reason. Not only the, the fact that it was used, being used as booster material still today, uh, but also that it's, in order to create a scene like this, you need fossilized remains of large creatures. Uh, you need fossilized flora. To put it together, uh, and sort of an, a sense of uh, of the climate, uh, of what this this place would have looked like uh, in the past, a, a kind of full environmental view uh, of it. And this was being developed during this period. So after the Civil War, authoritative knowledge of ancient West was conveyed to audience interested in exploiting the region through USGS surveys that took advantage of the growing rail system at the same time. So go back a little bit to uh, Leo Lesquereau again. In the late 19th century, he liked to call himself the historian of our coal fields. Uh, he noted that fossilized plant matter found within and near coal was vital to revealing ancient Western, Western climate. Not just seeing the plants, but getting a full vision of what the climate was like during this period. He says, as, veg as vegetation is in absolute relation with atmospheric circumstances, the fossil plants are indeed the written records of the atmospheric and physical conditions of our Earth at the epochs which they represent. Thus using coal, the fossil fuel that powered technologies of Western expansion, paleobotanists could paint a nearly complete picture of environments and climates long past. This could be done verbally, uh, as it often was done in these USGS sur survey reports, uh, kind of talking vividly about what these environments would look like, often comparing them to tropical environments of, of the present. Um, but this could also be done quite literally, as we saw the one from Wyoming, but this has a tradition, the tradition of paleo portraits, or scenes from deep time, as Martin Rodwick has called them. Um, this is one I actually saw when I was moving out west. Um, uh, it's the advertising for South Dakota. Uh, it's on the side of U-Haul, the super graphics, uh, that they, they talk about as educating the public uh, about, uh, about the nation. Um, Actually, some of the, one of the germs for this project in some ways, too. Um, one of the first scenes from Deep Time is this one, Duria Antiquar, from 1830, by uh, Henry, de la, Henry de la Beche. Uh, he actually put it together for his fossil hunting friend, Ma uh, Mary Anning. Um, but it's one of the first ones documented of giving this full vision uh, of what the sea pass could look like. Uh, later, this is from 1909, from the life of a fossil hunter, uh, a memoir of Charles Sternberg, uh, a Western fossil hunter. Um, so this, this was a thing that was done. We give a full vision of what this West could, could, could be, could have been. But as I noted, large vertebrate fossils are also needed, and in part due to the physical nature of the region, including its aridity. These were to be found in abundance in the West. So do its geohistory, uh, which, you know, is not disconnected from its, its, its present aridity, uh, but paired both this wet, wet, wet past and its present aridity has made this area a region that you can find fossils uh, and that has preserved fossils, uh, and which made them really prominent in government reports as well. Then these surveys, uh, this is Edward Drinker Cope, uh, one of the major fossil hunters of the period, exploring the American West. The value of the deep past is often interpreted in conjunction with commentary on the progress of civilization, as Lescaro did. 
Another example comes from this paleontologist. He began his piece talking about civilization, his section on the paleontology of the West talking about civilization. He says, it was in its geologic past as an old bed of seas and lakes, which has been so gradually elevated as this suffered little disturbance, that he saw the future of the region. This, Cope prophesies, quote, is the great source of its wealth in nature's creations of vegetable and animal life, and from it will be drawn the wealth of its future inhabitants. End quote. So the watery past of the West would yield a wondrous and wealthy future. But he added this addendum to it. Quote, so long as peace and steam bind the natural sections of our country together. End quote. And then he went into his verbal description of the West, uh, this ancient West. His very vivid, draw you in descriptions. For example, these strange creatures, flying saurian, flapped their leathery wings over the waves, and often plunging seized many an unsuspecting fish, or soaring at a safe distance viewed the sorts and combats of the more powerful soaring of the sea. At nightfall, we may imagine them trooping to the shore and suspending themselves to the cliffs by the claw-bearing fingers of their wing limbs. Tortoises were the boatmen of the Cretaceous waters of the eastern coast. So importantly, passages like these that paired these two were embedded in government surveys that had really the express purpose of documenting the resources for future exploitation. So Western Coal granted environmental mastery while fossils found in the West spoke of its former Edenic qualities as a verdant, watery world. Coal had given a glimpse into the flora of the West, but the fossilized remains of fauna completed the picture of a formerly water, watery continent that seemed to be constantly in flux. That wasn't just paleontologists who were experiencing this. Uh, I'm going to draw your attention to back to Long, uh, back to Long survey, because uh, this is an interesting moment here. This is a painting of a steamboat. Long thought that he would be able to go up the Missouri River on a steamboat. Didn't work out so well. But it had a very peculiar design. Uh, and you can see it you draw on here. Uh, it, was also, it, was, it was named the Western Engineer, in the boat, official name, but it was also called Long's Dragon because of this smoke billowing dragon's head at the front of the boat. That was where the, the steam smoke was, was diverted. Contemporaries considered the purpose of this design to instill fear in Native Americans. What they may not have known is that they could have been tapping into Native American legends derived from fossil remains such as, quote, water monsters of the Sioux. Fossils found in the West fit into many Western tribe cosmologies, and fossil caches could be viewed as sacred sites. Paleontologists searching the West took advantage of Native American fossil knowledge, and were happy to have them saved by what O.C. Marsh, Cope's component in the Bowen Wars in the West. Uh, he called it savage superstition, that saved these uh, resources um, from being despoiled. So these relics clearly had a different cosmological meaning for Euro-Americans. Furthermore, the surging transportation and communication frontiers sustained the process of dispossession and brought scientists like Cope and Marsh into the field, but they also expedited news of discoveries detailing the changes changing west of the public. But the Western public did not simply read about the ancient west. Luckily, due to their durable and curious nature, fossils were a common collectible for many Westerners who would often donate specimens to paleontologists and provide directions to local fossil quarries. These interested amateurs were professors, farmers, missionaries, ministers, merchants, postmasters, doctors, real estate dealers, domestic workers, editors, lawyers, judges, engineers, surveyors, artists, soldiers, quarrymen, road workers, etc. Just to give you a sense of this, this is from 1875, the Smithsonian Circular, uh, sent out to kind of gauge interest uh, in correspondence. Uh, Kansas Farmer, says, I'm especially interested in meteorology and geology, and I have quite a collection of geological specimens, such as my surrounding supply. The farming of land, he probably turned up a number of geologically interesting uh, specimens and just you know, held them in, in, his, in his possession. Um, what he thought of them specifically, well, probably we never know. Um, but he was encountering them, he was touching them in his life. There's a house mother from Iowa 
Uh, since natural history is a subject of much interest to me, um, but basically she doesn't have time to pursue it as a, as a uh, means, means of study. There's a miscellaneous collection of minerals, shells, sea mosses, petrifications, savage weapons, etc., but that are not categorized. So there was interest out there in utilizing and, and touching and experiencing these, um, these resources uh, in uh, this region. So inspired by the breakneck pace and power of cold field civilization and the faith in Western expansion, they could have received the malleability of their surroundings using the fossils of the West as conduits to the past. Paleontologists were well aware of the value of these locals as well and called upon their help in official USGS documents uh, and newspapers and also in Western field. Uh, so they needed someone to help lift up a uh, very heavy fossil from, uh, from, from its context. Uh, they would call upon locals to do so. And locals could point them in direction, uh, places they knew were, were rich. Uh, this is an example from the survey. As it's desirable to develop the science of geology, the writer would be glad if his friends in the West would forward to him in Philadelphia, at his expense, specimens of bones or teeth which they may find. He will return to them determinations of their nature and credit them with discoveries which may result from their care and interest in preserving them in the publications of scientific bodies. Along with it would come fame, too. There was, there was a sort of, a, uh, you know, this, this was sort of a call as well to, to get people interested, amateurs uh, involved in the scientific practice. Some of these mid to late 19th century Westerners even became celebrated fossil hunters and famed paleontologists. I mentioned Charles Sternberg. Um, he found fossils in the Kansas limestone as a child. And from then, he was hooked. Um, he said this wonderful memoir, Life of the Fossil Hunter. Uh, the whole family of Sternbergs from, um, from essentially Charles Sternberg uh, on, uh, sort of this legacy of, of fossil hunters uh, that develop. Another famous figure is a paleontologist who found uh, some of the first evidence of uh, T. rex in the West. Uh, Barnum Brown, also known as Mr. Bones. He explored the overburden of his father's coal stripping operation. And then there, he said, he found many fossil seashells and remains of other marine invertebrates. When he became old enough to notice and take an interest in such things, Brown said, he used to follow the strippers in order to pick up all the fossils that they turned up. Brown's father, according to, to Brown, though when trained in geology, encouraged him in making these collections, for he thought that by doing so, we could find out why seashells could be found entombed in a Kansas hilltop 650 miles from the nearest seacoast of the Gulf of Mexico. Now, how does knowledge get translated? As I mentioned, boosting. And this happened pretty heavily uh, in this particular um, text, Buffalo Land. Boosters used the geologic paths of the West to promote the region. A prime example is this 1872 booster tract Western adventure novel, Buffalo Land, an authentic account of the discoveries, adventures, and mishaps of a scientific and sporting party in the Wild West. William Webb had connections with Cope. Uh, he actually would provide Cope with fossils, had done so, and, and led him to fossil sites, uh, but also involved Cope in, in attempts to do some land speculation in Kansas as well. Webb used geological and paleontological knowledge he gained from Cope to boost for the region. A land office agent booster, Webb drew upon Hayden's USGS reports in order to construct appendices that spoke to the coal-powered promise and wonderful fertility of the West. The protagonist of West, uh, Webb's Buffalo Land, was almost surely based in Cope, was called Professor Paleozoic, uh, which he was uh, a geological authority of the highest order. Uh, but in this text, significantly, Webb used this character's richly poetic description of the ancient West when he turned his attention to overturning Long's dismal geography known as the Great American Desert. They're in direct juxtaposition. It says, we are on a great earth ocean, Paleozoic mused. Upon either side, until striking against the shores of the horizon, the billows of buffalo grass rolled away. Here, the mighty ru ruler proclaimed that what was once ocean would henceforth be land. But evidence of this ocean would not be lost because whenever man's busy industry cleaves us under the surface, the depths like those of the ocean give back their monsters and rare shells. Using these materials, Paleozoic described the plains of the region previously colored with lakes that abounded with fish. 
And it was vegetation once so beautiful and so rich in growth that earth has now absolutely nothing with which to compare it. Later, just before quoting directly from Cope, Cope described the tertiary as, quote, a land fertile as the Garden of Eden. Out of the public interest and fossil curiosities, a vernacular science of the West geologic history was emerging, was being mustered to support a variety of objectives. These vernacular theories could rest upon the credentials of scientists who often saw the West as plastic with great potential. Ferdinand van der Rie Hayden is a prime example of this. He's the leader of these USGS surveys, one of the first surveys of the territories. He had what I, what I term a paleo-restorative dream uh, in the West. And he kind of provided some of the underlying support for a, a variant of rainfall as the plow, giving it scientific credence. So in the first survey, 1867, the survey of the ter territories embracing Nebraska, he illustrated how one could use environmental insight granted by coal and fossils to hasten the West's natural variation. He didn't imagine a scene looking into a coal seam. He imagined a scene during the tertiary period when the lignite beds were deposited. And all these treeless plains are covered with a luxuriant growth of forests, now found only in tropical or subtropical climates. Ancient relics such as silicified trunks gave Hayden the power to travel back in time, connect the deep past with the near future of the West. He said, we are daily obtaining more and more evidence that these forests may be restored again to a certain extent. Uh, and during this time, forests were deeply connected to climate uh, and deeply connected to ideas of potential for a landscape to support agriculture. So in fact, he said, a belt or zone of country about 500 miles in width east of the base of the Rocky Mountains could be redeemed through artificial restoration. So from the Rocky Mountains, essentially, almost all the way to the Mississippi, the Great Plains region. In Hayden's 1871 Wyoming report, he reiterated, the time is not very distant when portions of the country will be covered with beautiful artificial forests, and we will attempt to show that this is only a restoration of conditions that once existed in far in the geologic past. Contributing to Hayden's 1874 Colorado report was a professor of natural science and geology, Samuel Augie. Augie is perhaps best known for providing a scientific basis and inspiration for Charles Dana Wilbur's coining of the phrase rainfall as a plow uh, in his uh, text, The Great Valleys and Prairies of Nebraska in the Northwest. But before he wrote the tract that inspired Wilbur, Augie collaborated with Hayden and shared his dreams of restoring the West. Finding remains of, quote, geologically recent forests in Nebraska's peat, he questioned the cause of their disappearance, and, and he was inspired by, quote, how nature responds to the efforts of man. He believed humans could be an efficient agent for the production of geological changes. Once, quote, trees are planted by the million, Augie predicted, quote, an approach will be made to some of the best physical conditions of tertiary time. And this is, uh, that was Augie here, uh, and this is the uh, rain maps from uh, Charles Dana Wilbur's uh, text and that shows uh, rain lines advancing into the west over uh, decade intervals. Rain following settlement uh, and cultivation of the land. By the late 1880s, there was little hope that rain would follow the plow. But faith that the West was plastic remained. There were last-ditch efforts to change the climate with explosive and mysterious chemical mixtures in the 1890s. But soon it was clear that a broader vision was needed to make the West the garden it once was. It's time to go back to Mars for a moment. A man by the name of Percival Lowell, who saw life on Mars, sat within this new context where state-level reclamation was getting its start and the progressive era was coming into its own. For Lowell, the desiccated desert planet on Mars served as an example of technological expertise in reclaiming the dying Earth. Mars, according to Lowell, had canals built on it that would be seen through his telescope. They were built by enlightened Martians who had joined together in the face of an environmental crisis on their dying planet. Like all planets, according to Lowell, Mars had undergone a process of cooling and dewatering that would in time leave it lifeless and dry. The conclusion to be drawn from Earth's geologic history, and he, he put, printed and reprinted Dana's maps in, in his text, showing the dewatering, what he perceived as the dewatering of the North American continent, was that arid environments like those found in Western America necessitated technic technocratic government intervention for their future survival. The future of humanity's relationship to the natural world was one of absolute mastery. 
that at this time could really only be conceived of uh, in a nation empowered by massive, massive resources of coal. Irrigation became the savior of the rest, and soon it was realized that it took a lot of organization capital and coal to create these works necessary for successful agriculture. Through the state first with the Cary Act, and then with the Newlands Act in 1902. The work of William Cody in the town that bears his name in Wyoming straddled this transition. He began the enterprise under the Cary Act and was taken over by the Reclamation Service. Cody had selected this site due to the education that he received when he was a guide for the paleontologist O.C. Marsh, who spoke of an ancient lake that deposited fertile soils in the region that could be utilized, could be irrigated. All they needed was water, and this place would be perfect uh, for settlement. So the West watery geology played a vital role in this decision to make this region culturally viable. It's interesting enough, the Shoshone Dam that resulted from the Royal Commission Service's efforts was reported as a triumph over the geologic history of the area. On February 6, 1910, the New York Times reported that perhaps the Shoshone would never have undertaken the job of cutting through the canyon if it had known that Mr. Roosevelt was coming. George Wharton James, uh, in his text Reclaiming the Arid West, in 1917, the sort of history of uh, the beginnings of the Reclamation Service. Uh, he saw that engineers sought to, quote, repair the damages done by prior ice, ice ages and restore to the plains streams and the headwaters which the past geologic ages probably belonged to them. So humans, with the help of coal, were here to complete nature's work in the West. So to conclude briefly. Scientists and boosters had partnered with coal and fossils to liberate the West from the oppression of the desert. Coal not only had the ability to physically energize concrete processes and machinery, but also to energize imaginations in unprecedented ways. The fossil fuel had given a glimpse into the floor of the West, and the fossilized remains of fauna completed the picture of a wet and formerly forested continent that seemed to be constantly in flux. Not only that, but the ancient West of the Cretaceous and Tertiary were also considered as responsible for creating the fertile soils awaiting agricultural settlement. And you see this repeatedly through irrigation documents and irrigation boosters. Using the scientific data collected by explorers, settlers, and men of science throughout the 19th century, a vernacular science of the West was being continuously redeployed and reformulated. In the context of America's rapid industrialization and thrust westward after the Civil War, a geology of the region was put to use in order to justify these imperatives, see the nation's future as derived providentially from its past. In the end, the energetic power of coal helped to support an unyieldingly optimistic view of the West built from otherworldly and presumptive power of fossils. Rudy may have been a fact of life in the region, and is, continues to be, but its geologic history helped to make that fact evanescent in the eyes of many Americans. And I'll leave you with a um, slightly disturbing image. Um, this is the title, uh, this is Alexis Rockman's Manifest Destiny, uh, showing Manhattan submerged um, under, underwater uh, in a sort of apocalyptic future uh, that could come with, with climate change. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Reminds me of Simon Winchester's The Map That Changed the World, mm -hmm. these sort of wonderful, powerful histories of coal. So I have two questions, the yep. first of which, why coal? Why is coal mm -hmm. inspiring so much? imagination on different continents. Mm -hmm. And second question, if students are interested in following up and pursuing this type of research, what would be your career paths and recommendations mm -hmm. for them? Mm -hmm. um, the way I see it, uh, coal, especially in the American context, this is the period of inc incredible industrialization, or this, this, this push of industrialization. And, and as these coal, coal resources are, are being found in abundance in, in the West, um, and is these comparisons are being made between Britain as well uh, during this period, saying you know, the resources are being exhausted in Britain, but we have un unlimited and inexhaustible resources in, in, in America. It, it became a sign of America's greatness and its potential for, for you know, basically becoming a world power. Um, so coal, I think, as a resource, as a heavily energetic resource, uh, gave, granted a sense of optimism as the capacity for humans uh, to change their world, change their environment, uh, to master their environment. Um, I think that's really the basis of this. It, it gave, you know, just like, you know, the anxieties of the nuclear age, uh, the sort of anxieties of, of what nuclear power, nuclear energy can do, you know, the power to essentially destroy the world, 
be sort of an opposite, <laughs> in some ways, an opposite, opposite perspective. Um, there was a generation of this very optimistic vision. But also, you know, with nuclear energy, it's very, you know, also the reaction to the Plowshares Project, for example, the possibility for, for doing, becoming planetary engineers. Um, you know, you have that sort of tension also developing during this, this, uh, this period with coal, too. Like, you have the optimism, as well as you have the preservation and conservation movement saying, wait a minute, our, our push using this coal, these coal resources have, have, have made us start to despoil uh, the world. Um, so I think it, it produces what some would call sort of the, uh, a, a, modern, a modern moment, uh, a modern tension, uh, where human capacity for change is, is embraced simultaneously as it is um, a troubling matter um, and really kind of inspires people to think about why that tension exists and how, that, how, they, how they're going to interact with the world. Um, as for career, career path, how, um, are, you, are you sort of asking how I got into this sort of? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my path was unconventional, probably. I mean, just like I think most people are. Uh, so I entered into an uh, environmental science degree at the University of Connecticut for the first two years of study in environmental science. So I got kind of the basic science courses. Um, but then I found my passion in history, completed my degree in history. Um, did a master's at the University of Connecticut, but during the summer took courses in the sciences. Um, still sort of interested in that inter intersection. Uh, after I completed my master's, I went to University of um, uh, Montana for a, a master's in environmental studies. Um, so I was there for, I was just for there for a semester and just, I just didn't mesh with the program and I was kind of, kind of getting tired of, uh, of the academy to be completely tr truthful. Um, I was just getting, getting worn out. So I worked, at, worked outside of the academy for a while. Um, and then I, you know, I wanted to get back. And from there I, I, I you know, applied for programs and found one with space creative space for me to join these two. Um, one that I could, I could do both, had the kind of intellectual freedom to, to explore the both and the intersection of both. Uh, I found such a program in, in, uh, in Bozeman, Montana, or Montana State University. Um, so it was sort of a long period of cultivating both interests, uh, still maintaining both interests in the history as well as the sciences, um, and doing my best to kind of at least try and maintain a layman's, you know, touch on on, 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 the, on the sciences, you know, I, I, I do my best, uh, often probably, uh, often probably fall short. Um, it, but it's trying to cultivate both, uh, which is, you know, it, it's, a, it's a challenging thing. Um, it's a challenging thing, I think, for anyone engaged in environmental studies program to, to balance them both. Uh, it's a, but it's a wonderful thing. It's something I achieve, I attempt to, I attempt to engage. Um, but it's trying to cultivate them both, so doing, doing your best to kind of maintain your interest in, in both arenas. I have a follow-up question on her first one, and then I have mm -hmm. a second one that's more contemporary. So you did a nice, a really beautiful job at sort of using the historical record to sort of con convince me that this, this interest in fossils penetrated every aspect of society in the West. And, 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 and from, from all these different people that are out there where they're amateur collectors. Mm -hmm. Then there's the c group of people you, you captured that were interested in reforesting the West, bringing back that, that lush part, which scientifically wouldn't mesh with the changes that had happened before. So I'm curious to me how much that was sort of a few voices that were kind of promoting me, kind of mm -hmm. like today's rewilding the West, that mm -hmm. we're going to bring back the DNA and we're going to make mammoths and have a march around the West, or how much of it that also was part of the sort of conversation that penetrated everywhere that we're going to bring back the forest. So that's my first question. I'll get to the second one after you answer that. It's, there's debates as to whether, uh, as to how deeply not only the great American desert penetrated the American consciousness uh, and, and where, as well as how influential uh, theories such as rainfall as the plow were on the actual settler perceptions in, in getting to the American West. Uh, my investigations have, have, have led me to the conclusion that there was a sentiment uh, at least it was drawn out in, in, in diaries and, and um, um, you know, field notes of, of, of even some of these scientists interacting with settlers, that there was a sense that the, the region was changing, how exactly it, was, it wasn't clear. Yeah. Um, but there was a number of reforesting projects um, that were, there was actually some that were successful in the Nebraska Sandhills. Um, yeah. So they had, they had scientific ones that they could call upon as, uh. as ones that were, were, could actually take root in even a very relatively hot, or actually pretty hostile environment. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's there's a there's a there's a bit of leapfrogging that's being done here, and that's basically you know, especially from our, our perspective, and, and to people of the time too, of course, that this is this is nonsense. Uh, yeah. You can't just leapfrog through time and change the landscape back to back to back to tertiary yeah. Yeah. Uh, by just replanting a you know vastly replanting trees. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know what I think is you know a solid conclusion I can, I, I, I draw is that. There's, there is at least an attempt to connect this science, uh, and the science was able to um, be conveyed to the public as a, as a reasonable basis for the possibility yeah. for, for change. Yes, yes. Um, I hope that answers your question. No, it does, it does. So my second question is, is that I've, the railroads still control the West in a really powerful way, and I, I guess it reminds me that, and I hadn't really made the connection until you talked about how important coal transport was, but getting the natural gas out of the out of these same deposits has made it so it's really affected the agricultural transport from those farmers that are trying to use this this new discovery of these fertile lands to get their products out and so i'm curious has the railroad always been a very energy controlled or did it did it wax and wane or have have we just been like if you're trying to compete with the energy sector to get things on the Railroad, you'll, you'll never win, and that's maybe why we have so many trucks in the United States because the railroads are monopolized by the energy sector. So that's sort of my question. That's sort of contemporary. I mean, I would say I, I would say yes to a certain extent. The railroads have 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 been deeply connected with energy markets. Uh, I mean, my own experience is mainly in the American West, but I mean, any transportation network. So take even just in the East Coast, Pennsylvania. Coal canals. Mm -hmm. um, the canals were sort of the fir one of the first ways of, of transporting transporting coal from point to point. Um, but you know that transportation infrastructure uh, that was long distance uh, was necessary for getting these resources that were often more remote uh, from the point of, a point of use uh, mm -hmm. in order to make them economically viable. But I think I think there is a long history. Um, of these transportation, transportation corridors, you know, the railroads as, as a major example of this, being deeply controlled by, the, by uh, and connected to the energy markets. And they, they controlled the mines initially. I mean, they, they owned the mines. The, the railroad um, companies owned the mines mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Oh. Um, you know, which is not, uh, not, the, not the same case anymore. Yeah. Um, so the relationship has since evolved. Um, but yeah, I think, they're, you know, I think they're deeply intertwined. Any other questions? Well, thank you for such a fascinating exploration of coal in the West, and boy, our opinions have changed over the years. Thank you very much. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you.